I don't have to waste CPU. Okay, so I got to figure out how to do like a streaming from a capture card or something. But I don't want to spend time starting applications while I'm competing with CPU for bandwidth. So I'm going to stop my video and then share my screen. Ta da! Alrighty, can you see my screen? Maybe? Okay. Yes, sir. Sweet. All right, good stuff. Um, hey, seriously, so good to see you, Peter. Uh, I wish I could invite you over for, you know, uh, literally anything. I mean, I would just be I know. I over the, the moon. Way. I, let's go do our taxes together. Let's get a root <laughs> canal. I mean, I would be happy to do that at this point. I would just be over the moon, uh, happy to see you and Stefan, of course. So uh, this is the crazy time of the year. I know the bar is so low. It's like, I'm going to take out the trash. Oh my gosh, what should I wear? Yeah. Want to meet me? We could, we could look at each other from 20 feet away. Yeah. I, I'm, I, I had a long story short, but I, I have a friend who was in a situation where he had to explain that after he looked at a condo, uh, that he had chest pain, right? So he went to go see a condo with the realtor, but he had chest pain. And so he had to then trigger this. It turned out to be a false alarm. It was literally just gas. It was, it was an antacid cleared it all up. But because of COVID, now he's in a situation where he has to volunteer. Hey, Mr. Realtor, I, you know, I might be dying or I might have just eaten something spicy. I don't know. Uh, prepare to die, right? Like that's the situation. That's that's 2020 for us, right? It was that that horrible situation. Indeed. Yeah. So I I would love for that to change. Um, my my partner, my better half Tammy, she's a um dog groomer, and so I look like a poodle, but my hair has been cut. So that's one of the things I don't have problems with. Um, so you know, I feel bad for the rest of you. Uh, okay, good, 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 good. Let's get going. So we don't have a lot of time, as always. As always, I want to encourage you to take note of this slide. This is arguably the most important slide in the whole deck. Uh, my name is Josh Long. I work on the Spring team. I'm a Spring developer advocate. I am a recently minted Kotlin GDE or Google developer expert and a uh, Java champion, ostensibly sponsored by Oracle. But, you know, I don't, I don't put that there because it's, I don't know, Google, Oracle. I, I think you can tell why I chose one over the other. So there's that. And then there's a Twitter. I'm on the Twitter. So if you have questions, comments, feedback, whatever, find me there. Uh, if you want to uh, email me, I am happy to answer emails. I'm a big fan of emails. Uh, I'm asynchronous. I, I'm not nearly so asynchronous as I was uh, last year. Last year, I got around. This year, I just, I, you know, I get paid to sit in my pajamas, basically. Uh, so, you know, I'll, I'll probably get back to you a lot quicker. But either way, I'm happy to hear from you. Don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, but I work on the spring team as part of what I do. I get to talk to amazing people like yourselves. Thanks so much for coming out. You know, I live in San Francisco. That's the thing, friends. I'm, I'm actually not all that far from you, in theory. Uh, but we're separated by one good working pair of lungs. So not good. Um, I am on Safari. That's like a, it's like Netflix, except, uh, uh, you know, it's an all you, all you can eat technical marketplace for technical content. It's a prefix uh, technical marketplace, except that unlike Netflix, uh, you know, you might, you might learn something. So that's cool. Uh, and I am a book author. So back in 2017, I did a book called Cloud Native Java that's available in a number of different languages. I have a podcast that I do every Friday that's just me talking to people that are smarter than I am. It's a low, low bar. So that's, uh, that's nice. Uh, Stefan, I think, was on the show. Yeah, he was on the show uh, a year ago or something like that. So if you want to hear from a really, really smart person, go, go listen to that one. Uh, and uh, of course, every Tuesday, I do a roundup called This Week in Spring, which is just a recap of all the news that spits a reprint, uh, with apologies to the New York Times, of course. Uh, and uh, it's just, you know, stuff in the ecosystem, videos, blogs, uh, tweets, uh, uh, whatever, right? Presentations, um, podcasts, uh, that kind of stuff. So go uh, see that. That's every Tuesday in spring that I have a blog and every Wednesday with some breaks. I'm in the middle of, an, uh, middle of my seasons right now, but I, every, I do a season of episodes and every episode uh, comes out on a Wednesday and uh, it's called Spring Tips. It's a screencast series and there's now getting close to, I don't know, 80 or something like that, 80 episodes. So um Lots of good stuff there. Go check that out. And of course, I have a book on which I'm working uh, right now. It's called Reactive Spring. And Reactive Spring is a uh, book all about how to build reactive applications. You can buy the book now. You can read it right now. It's not yet done, though. When it is done, you'll get the final edition if you buy it now. Uh, and we're, it's almost done. I, I think I've got three more chapters to do 
uh, thereabouts. And I'm, I've just been dragging my feet on that and I'll get to it. But um, either way, the book is in working order. It's, uh, it's mostly there right now. Uh, and maybe you don't need it. Heck, uh, we're going to talk about Reactive Spring tonight. We're going to talk about what it is to build Reactive Spring-based applications uh, tonight. So maybe, just maybe, you don't need it. Okay, so let's talk about Reactive Applications and reactive programming. Uh, it, first of all, some motivation, some context. Why do we care about reactive programming? We care about it because we want to be able to write software that takes better advantage of the resources that we have in our system. And we want a programming model that allows us to more, uh, more robustly, more safely build uh, services that do network interactions, or at least interactions, right? Any kind of interaction. I want to have a, a better way of saying, hey, that's not going to work. I want to handle the failure uh, accordingly. So if you look at most services uh, out in the wild, you'll find that a lot of them, especially those on the JVM, uh, as deployed on their uh, particular hosts and ports and, and services and so on, are idle. They're just doing nothing. They're waiting for something to happen, uh, but uh, nothing is happening. And the thing that they're waiting for, in most cases, is input and output. And that's because this software, these kinds of services, tend to use the traditional approach to uh, I.O. on the JVM. That is to say, Java I.O. input stream. Now imagine what you get if you use java io input stream and you ask for the next byte you say java io input stream dot read and you're asking for the next byte uh you're forced to just wait there your whatever thread you're executing on even if it's the main thread is stuck at that point in time not able to do anything else and that's a pretty greedy thing to do what you're actually forcing the operating system to do is to give you that thread for as long as it takes to wait for the next byte what what, what results from this is that you have very few threads. Threads are a finite resource, uh, and so you can't add more of them. They're not free, uh, and yet you can't handle any more requests because even though you're not doing anything, you're stuck. You're blocking, waiting for that thread. So what we want is some way of saying, hey, I don't want to pull that byte out of the input stream. Instead, I'd rather the thing that's got the bytes, I want that thing to produce those bytes and give them to me when they're ready and no sooner. So this is a bit of an inversion. Instead of me pulling bytes out of the producer, the bytes push them to me. And by doing that, I can write my code in such a way that when I'm not busy actually processing the bytes, then I'm not sitting on the thread waiting for bytes. I can do something else. I can reuse those threads, repurpose those threads uh, in the system to do something else. Uh, and that's done uh, so that we can now handle more requests. In this way, we uh, achieve kind of a better bin packer, right? Uh, think of, think of uh, reactive programming as a way of being more efficient and uh, having a programming model that supports uh, concurrent interactions with services. So that's the goal. That's what we want. Now, of course, in order to do this, as you can imagine, if everything from the IO layer up has to change in order to make that work, then what we need is a, a, a robust ubiquitous abstraction, something that can be used at different layers of the stack. And to support that, uh, we have the reactive streams specification. This is a sort of de facto uh, specification that was defined by the Spring team and by the uh, team over at Netflix, uh, the RxJava team, and of course the, uh, the team over at Lightbend. Na at the time, they were called TypeSafe, uh, working on Akka and Akka Streams. And of course, the team over at the Eclipse Foundation working on uh, VertX. So all of us got together and extracted out some common ground interfaces to support reactive programming. That gave us something foundational, something that we could then build on. That has then since been incorporated into Spring. And that, my friends, is the journey that we're going to see today. That's the journey that we're going to take today. And we're going to do that by building new software uh, by going to start.spring.io. Now, start.spring.io is, as always, my second favorite place on the internet. Uh, uh, maybe, maybe my third uh, at this point because I've been checking that COVID nineteen counter a lot, you know. So, but other than that, maybe it's it's possibly my still my second. So, I'm going to build a new service here, and I'm going to use a I'm going to use a Apache Maven. That's fine. You can use Gradle. I'm going to use Java, just fine, and I'm going to use Spring Boot two point three. X. It doesn't matter which 2.3, but I quite like 2.3. There are a couple of features. There are several features uh, that are really, 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 really compelling in Spring Boot uh, 2.3.0. Uh, one of them that I like, or actually several of them that I like, are very well explained by this video, by the one, the only, and the inimitable Phil Webb. That's Spring Boot co-founder Phil Webb. I'm not gonna. That's him right there. It says so. You can say. You can see it says Phil Webb. So this video introduces a lot of the cool stuff in Spring Boot 2.3, but as a TLDR, uh, we have availability uh, um, endpoints that, that can tell you 
uh, for Kubernetes in particular, whether an application is ready or not. We have graceful shutdown so that when you, when your container platform, be it Kubernetes or Cloud Foundry or whatever, uh, kills the application because it's, you know, it needs to be relocated or shut down or scaled down or whatever, uh, that we drain off existing in-flight transactions and then uh, shut down gracefully, right? Uh, we also have a uh, new support, really, really interesting support for building Docker images out of your Spring Boot application that's built in. So you can say Maven space Spring hyphen boot colon build hyphen image, and it'll use uh, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation build packs spec to then generate a Docker container that can then be, be deployed to whatever uh, container platform you want, right? Uh, these days, that's probably Daughters of the Donuts, going to be Kubernetes, uh, but you know, anything you want, right? It works just fine. Um, or you can even have, you can even customize the build. And instead of us doing everything for you, you can explicitly say, hey, I know that Spring Boot's Maven plugin is going to have an awareness of the libraries that are used for your Spring Boot application. And it's gonna have an awareness of the application code. That is to say the few class files that you have changed from one application to another, from one run of the application to another. And it's gonna have an awareness of all the other stuff, the optional dependencies, et cetera. So if it knows all that, then couldn't it then just separate them into Docker layers for me? And you can actually configure it not only to do that, but in what order and how to do that. And you can actually carve out custom layers and so on. So it's a very, really, really fully, um, you know, fleshed out uh, feature there. The other thing that the, uh, su the support in Spring Boot 2.3 gives us is the ability, the ability uh, to use the new Spring Growl native image feature. Now, uh, Spring, the Spring Growl native image feature uh, is a uh, not yet GA thing. Okay, it's not part of Spring Boot per se, but it's it's there. You can try it out, and we encourage you to try it out. I did a Spring Tips video on this right around the same day. Actually, I I clicked off of the Spring that I first this video before I had the chance to show you the other video that came after the Good Phil Webb's uh, video, and that's this one right here. That's just me looking at Spring and Growl VM Part Two. I actually did one of these way back in March or April, and that has since been ob uh, made obsolete by this uh, by the incredible strides that we've taken in the more recent months or so. So uh, I, I'm not gonna show you all of that, but I will show you the code. And the only thing you need to keep in mind here, friends, is that Growl, when I say Growl and Growl VM, I'm referring to uh, not the hotspot replacement, right? Not the just-in-time compiler uh, replacement from Gr that's, that's actually called Growl, that's from Oracle Labs. Uh, but I'm referring to, in this case, a particular feature in that project called the Native Image Builder. Uh, and the native image builder is pretty simple in theory. If Growl VM is by default an ahead of time, uh, sorry, it is, if it is by default a just-in-time compiler that takes frequently executed paths of, of Java code and turns them into native code, then how ludicrously cool would it be if we just took the whole darned Java application and turned it into native code and did that ahead of time before we actually launched the application as opposed to after the hundred thousandth uh, execution of a method or something like that, right? So that's a very, that's the idea in theory and it's super nice in theory, but it turns out uh, there's all sorts of things that the Growl native image builder hates. It hates so much stuff, my friends. It really is hateful. It hates uh, anything dynamic, any, any kind of trickiness. Think of all the things that you would love to do in C++. You, well, you, guess what? You can't do that really in, uh, in Growl native images either, right? So reflection, that's a nice idea, right? Uh, things like that go away. So proxies, you, you can do some of these things, but they can't be truly dynamic. That is to say, you have to tell GraalVM ahead of time what you're doing. So it's not really dynamic reflection, but it is reflection of a sorts. Um, and if you're willing to do that, if you're willing to feed it all that information, it can uh, take your JVM jar application and create a, a native architecture specific uh, machine image, uh, an actual binary that only runs on the, uh, on the platform to which you've targeted it. Uh, and the process takes a long time. That's the other caveat. That's the other thing that's not so great. So this is not going to be, this is certainly not going to be part of your day-to-day -day development cycle uh, because it can take several minutes to build an application this way, right? Um, and that's for Java. I mean, can you imagine like my, I, I don't know if it works this way. I haven't tried it out, but imagine Scala code and then Growl VM like is that a multiplicative like what's the array there do i get like hundreds of minutes i don't i don't even know what that looks like uh so i have a job i have a bunch of java applications here and i've uh i've got one using spring boot and spring data jpa and hibernate right so and and apache tomcat this is assuredly not reactive let's be very clear about that i'll show you the code though here's the here's the application 
Uh, it's a Spring Boot application. You know, you can tell because it says Spring Boot application. Uh, I've told it to not proxy at bean methods. Uh, so that's kind of nice. I've had to exclude one auto configuration class. That should be a bug that won't need to persist. Uh, and then in order, once I've done that, it's just business as usual. I've got a REST controller. I've got a customer repository. I'm using Lumbuck uh, to inject the, uh, to synthesize a constructor. Uh, I'm returning the data from my repository. I've got an initializer that's going to start and just log some records into the database, uh, you know, to save them into the database. And then I've got my Spring Data JPA repository and my Spring Data JPA Hibernate entity. Uh, so I've got at entity, right? And it's at ID and at generated value. These are all JPA annotations. All of that is pretty stock standard kind of stuff. Uh, what I had to do that's a little different is remember, no dynamic behavior. So while Spring is doing the right thing here, in this case, we had to, we had to cajole uh, Hibernate to do the right thing a little bit here. So we, we um, customized Hibernate's build. And this is a feature, right? This is a thing you can do in Hibernate. So it's, it wasn't that hard. All we had to do was tell it to build the enhanced entities ahead of time, right? There's a plugin that they provide that does that for you. So uh, all this does is it takes the entities and instead of creating proxies at runtime, all that stuff gets built into the code at build time, uh, which means that then that coupled with what we're doing behind the scenes with our Spring Growl native feature uh, was enough. Oh, 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 sorry, no, that's not true. We also had to help tell Hibernate not to do it at runtime. So it doesn't know at runtime that we've already done it at build time. So we have to be very explicit about it with that one little property there. But once that's done, this application, uh, and this is by far the slowest application of the three I'm gonna show you, once that's done, well, this application, uh, it flies, right? No, you don't, you don't sleep on Hibernate if you get the joke. So target, and here's the JVM application, okay? So I'm gonna talk to, by the way, this is a little bit slower than it would normally be because I'm starting up H2 in memory on my local machine. So that's 4.2 seconds, that's the JVM application. That's not uh, uh, Growl, okay? Oh, and also I'm, I'm screencasting, I'm, I'm recording my screen so that, you know, discount uh, a little bit from that as well. Here we go, native image, JPA, and go. So that was uh, 0.2 seconds, okay, to get that up and running, 0.21. Let's round up and do 0.22 and if you include the JVM time. So that was the same application, localhost uh, customers. There you go. Uh, so that's working. And if I control C, there you go. It doesn't work, right? So that's that endpoint. Now I've got a Mongo application, MongoDB. So this is Apache Tomcat. Again, not reactive. It's a servlet-based stack. It's a uh, you know venerable tried and true, but it is still among the embedded uh, web servers uh, that we have. It's one of the slower ones, right? So I've got that, and it's MongoDB. Uh, Java minus jar target uh, MongoDB application. Okay, good. So that's up in 2.4 seconds. So a good deal faster using just Spring Data. This is again, not reactive. Spring Data MongoDB, a uh, good deal faster than what I had before, but now target native uh, MongoDB. And voila, that's 0 0.131 seconds. Again, considerably faster, right? 0.1, not 0 0.1 seconds. And then finally, uh, my reactive one. This is we're going to write code. <clears throat> we're going to write code that looks more or less like this one. Uh, so target native image, uh, reactive. Oh, sorry, Java minus jar, target uh, reactive. Okay. And there's the application. Two point six seconds. That doesn't seem right at all. Let's see. Two point. Okay. What is that? Yeah, well, okay, so 2.5 seconds for the JVM. As you're gonna see tonight, things run much faster in the IDE. Uh, so, and by the way, that's another feature that's in 2.3. It can actually unpack the uh, jar for you in the container, so it'll start up that much faster. Uh, okay, so target native image, uh, reactive. And ta-da, 0.1 seconds, right? 0 0.12 seconds in this case. Not bad, huh? Um, so, we have, uh, some work to be done. I'm not saying this is all perfect yet, but I'm saying I was able to compile all of those without any fiddling with configuration. It was just the same exact compile that sh. I use that same script for all three of them. Uh, and the only changes are, you know, you can see for yourself, the only changes are that exclude attribute thing in the proxy bean methods equals uh, false. Okay. Now that's, these are all neither here nor there. I just wanted to show you that Spring Boot 2.3 is Awesome. It opens up a whole world of stuff. And the other big feature in Spring Boot 2.3 is that the next release of Spring Boot will be in six months. So uh, while I love 2.3, I cannot wait for 2.4. You know why? Because it's coming really, really soon. It's uh, 
we're already what a month away since 2.3 came out. So I suspect within five months we'll be talking about 2.4, which is nice, and then six months after that, uh, 2.5, etc., or whatever, whatever the next thing is. So 2.3, we're going to use Lumbuck. We're going to use the reactive web support. We're going to use R socket. We're going to use Spring Security. We're going to use uh, MongoDB. We're going to use Postgres. We're going to use um, R2DBC. Okay, so now I've got a whole bunch of different reactive things there. Obviously, uh, I'm happy with these choices. Then we have the choice of which version of Java when I use. Uh, here, my friends, you have before you three different choices. But again, keep in mind, these aren't actually choices. These are things that you see on the screen of which only two are actually choices, Java 14 and Java 11. Java 11 is the current long-term supported version of Java. That's a safe, if cowardly, place to park your application if you want to right now. It's the current long-term supported version of Java, so it'll be okay. That said, the current version of Java is Java 14. You can't use Java 11 without saying it's the old or non-current supported version of Java. You have to qualify it. That should tell you something. The current version of Java is Java 14. However, that won't be the current version of Java for very long. In another six months, we'll have another version of Java. So uh, if you are on a cloud platform, it should be trivial to convey or belt your code from one version of the JVM to another. Uh, but if not, I understand why you would seek refuge in the uh, warm and comfortable uh, embrace of Java 11. But you should definitely not use Java 8. Java 8 is the old version of Java. It's no longer the current or even long-term supported ver version of Java. It is technically inferior in every way. It has less syntax, less language features, less performance, less uh, robustness, less security, less everything. Java 14 <clears throat> is better technically in every way. It's also better morally, my friends. It's better as a moral choice. Are you prepared to have that discussion with your family when they ask you why you're still using Java 8 in production, I don't think you are. I don't think you're gonna be uh, happy with that experience. So avoid it at all costs. Now, I'm gonna generate my project here and I'm gonna open this up in my IDE and it's just a very simple trivial application and we don't have that long, so I'm not gonna spend too much stuff here, too much time on the basics. I'm not sure when the last time I would have seen you all was, but uh, I probably talked about MongoDB. So we're gonna build an application that writes data to the database. Uh, as always, I'm gonna comment out some of the bits that I don't need just yet. Pond.xml. Alrighty, now, here we go. Now we're gonna uh, comment out the stuff we don't need just yet. So MongoDB, uh, we're gonna, sorry, R2BC, goodbye. Uh, did I choose Postgres? Yeah, I did. I'm gonna keep Postgres, but I'm gonna comment out the dependency. Here we are. And I'm gonna comment out security for just a moment. Don't tell anybody I said that. Famous last words. Okay, so there we go. I'm left with it now just MongoDB and RSocket and Spring Webflex. Okay, so now I'm gonna build an application. And the application is gonna save data into the database. And I use that term charitably here. I'm gonna create an object of type reservation. I'm gonna save it to my database. It's gonna have a, a document key and a name. Uh, and of course, this is a document, so I wanna annotate as such using MongoDB's uh, document annotation, Spring Data MongoDB's document annotation. I'm gonna create a, consider, a constructor, a getter, a setter, two string, etc. cetera. Uh, obviously Java 14 has a preview feature for records, which I think is super cool. You should check that out. And then I'm gonna save the records to the database, creating a reservation uh, repository. Now this repository is an interface. It's part of Spring Data. I can extend this interface and the interface has methods supporting the usual data cycle, life cycle management. So you could use all sorts of different uh, reactive Spring Data implementations. Uh, to it, there are implementations for, among other things, Azure, Cosmos DB, Google Cloud, Firestore, and Spanner, Cassandra, MongoDB, Redis, Neo4j, Couchbase, and of course, Elasticsearch, because Elasticsearch is awesome. That's right, Peter. I love Elasticsearch. So these are all reactive implementations for NoSQL data stores. Um, really, really good choices, really good options. Uh, the repository that I'm using here is fairly straightforward. We have methods for saving, deleting, counting, all that kind of stuff. Uh, the methods, however, may be a little different. What's important is this type here, a publisher. A publisher is a producer of data. It publishes data asynchronously out of band to a subscriber. The subscriber consumes each new record uh, when the data is published. If there are any errors, it's consumed in the on error method. And when you're done processing the data, the on complete method is called. Now, when the subscriber first subscribes to the publisher, it is given a reference to a subscription. And this subscription is arguably the most important part here. This subscription is what they the uh, subscriber can use to ask the publisher to slow down. So you can request 
10 more records or a thousand more records or however much you feel you can handle in one fell swoop without being overwhelmed. So it's in this way that the subscriber has the ability to control the rate of production. That's very important here. The subscriber controls the cadence at which it consumes the data and therefore can't be overwhelmed, or at least in theory, it shouldn't be overwhelmed, right? Uh, if the subscriber wants to cancel the rate of production or stop the production, it can call cancel. This is not a, uh, on one hand, this is not a controversial idea, right? Ever since we had one computer on the same network as another, we've had flow control. And that's what this is. It's just basic flow control. On the other hand, this flow control uh, has sometimes been rebranded uh, by marketing folks as uh, uh, back pressure. So when you hear the term back pressure, just think, hey, this thing I've been able to do at the low levels of TCP and UDP for you know 70 years, uh, I can do now here. Or not, well, not 70 years, but decades. Many, 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 many decades. Okay. Now, uh, those types are super, super useful, and they make up three fourths of the um, uh, the reactive streams specification. There's a fourth type here called a processor, and a processor is a subscriber and a publisher. It's a bridge, it's a source and a sync. And that's it, that's the entire reactive stream specification. Useful though those types are, I think we can all agree they're a little bit Spartan. And that's okay because the different projects have come up with specialized, specialized approaches that uh, support more useful usage of those types. Uh, Project Reactor, which my friend Stefan was uh, one of the founders of, supports two specializations. Uh, the first of which is Mono, and Mono is a thing uh, that produces zero or one record. It also has a lot of different operators. Look at all those operators. These are, this is, this is the reason that uh, you shouldn't try and build your own because you're not going to be able to do a good job and you're going to spend half your life trying to get it right and you still won't end up with code that's as usable as Reactor is out of the box. Uh, and then we have Flux. So Flux is yet another specialized publisher. It produces zero to n where n is potentially unbounded and there's even more operators and even more code in this one uh, lots of stuff things like map and flat map and filter and so on so now i've got my repository i've got this these types from uh project reactor it's worth noting that those reactive streams types are so useful so useful that they have since been incorporated into the jdk so if you go to java util concurrent dot flow you'll see java util concurrent flow publisher subscriber subscription and of course uh, publisher and processor, right? So all that's now in the JDK itself, and these these things can be uh, used interchangeably. There's an adapter type. Now, I want to save some sample data into the database. Okay, like so. I'm going to create a Spring Bean application ready event class and public void go. Good. Now. I've got my types, I've got my method here. It's just a regular Spring Bean. And all I'm gonna do is when the application starts up, I'm gonna inject my reservation repository and I'm going to uh, inject that into the constructor there. So I'll say uh, flux.just Peter, and I've got uh, Stefan with an accent, and I've got, uh, who else is on the Spring team? Madura, she's awesome, and Violetta, and she's awesome. We've got Olga, awesome as well. Uh, Yushin, she's awesome as well. I'm on the swing team, I forgot about myself. Ah, and the great legendary Dr. Sire. Okay, so now we've got some names. These are people on the spring team. I'm gonna visit each one of these names and write it out uh, to a database, to the database. But in order to do that, I need to take each new reservation and call reservation repository at save. Now here, I'm gonna pass in this thing I've created. Now, the reason I'm calling flat map is because the result of save is actually a publisher, it's a mono of reservation. And so what I would actually get if I did map is I would get a publisher of publisher, I'd get a flux of mono of reservation, like so, right? That's a publisher within a publisher. I need to unpack or flatten the intermediate uh, reactive types, quite like the curve. So I'm going to flatten it by using flat map, okay? Now that gives me a stream of records that have been saved to the database. And again, I could chain these things together. I all too often do, in fact, I just, think it's useful for our uh, didactic purposes to kind of tease them apart into separate stages. Now, if I were to run this code right now, nothing would happen. The reason nothing would happen is because I haven't subscribed. I need to say names.subscribe. I could use the consumer there, but even here, while I'm happy with that, consider what would happen if I left this code unchecked. If I ran it the first time, I would have eight records in the database. The second time I would have uh, 16 and then 24 and so on. So what I wanna do is I wanna first delete everything I'll de delete all, and then I wanna make sure that after this is finished deleting everything asynchronously at a future point, after all that is done, then and only then, do I wanna run this pipeline here. 
and then and only then do I want to actually ask the uh, the repository for all the other records that are left, and then and only then do I want to print out the records like so. Okay, so this gives us a, uh, a deterministic behavior. I can delete everything, then write the data to the database, then find all the data, and then log it out. So let's go ahead and restart the application and confirm that that works. Delicious coffee. Decaf, mind you, but still delicious. All right, there's our data. You can see it's worked just fine. We've talked to the database. Uh, and if we go to MongoDB here, db.reservation.find. Good stuff. There we are. There's our records, uh, all, all uh, eight of us, all we happy few. We're all here in the database. So that works just fine. Uh, but of course, excuse me, people often ask, uh, what about? Uh, SQL data stores. Well, you can't use JDBC, my friends. JDBC isn't a great fit for what we're trying to do. So uh, a couple of years ago, well, no, three years ago, right? I guess so. it's got to be three years ago. We we started down the road of building R2DBC. I could be wrong about that. One of you, one of you gents might remember better than I do. Um, but anyway, we started building R2DBC, which is a reactive relational database connectivity abstraction. And it gives us a core SPI and a number of different implementations including but not limited to uh, Microsoft SQL Server, H2, PostgreSQL, MariaDB slash MySQL. Um, uh, I think SAP is there, you know, just lots of stuff, right? Lots of different implementations. So now with some code changes, I can change this to be an integer, a monotonically incrementing primary key as opposed to a UUID from MongoDB. Uh, and the primary key type here is integer as well. And voila, okay, I can run this. Uh, and it's complaining I don't have a URL. So I'm going to plug that in spring.datasource.url, uh, no, no, R2DBC URL. Okay. So R2DBC Postgres localhost orders and the username orders password orders. Okay. So there's the rewritten application. Don't tell anybody about my, um, my uh, connection string, please. I, it's a secret. R2DBC, okay, you need to do that right. And we're live, good. So there's the data. We have it in the database there. That works as well. So if I go here, uh, PSQL, U orders, orders, there it is. And I can say select all from reservation, right? And there we are, okay. So there's the records that we've written to the database uh, in both using SQL and NoSQL. Uh, either way it works just fine, right? now. A common question at this point is, can I do transactions? Right? Could I actually uh, create a transactional uh, service? And yes, you can. Uh, you, don't have to, you don't have to do anything particularly special, uh, except for maybe at enable transaction management, right? if you wanted that. Um, although I'm pretty sure you don't need that, so you could try it without and see what happens. Um, the important thing is not that you can use transactions, it's that you can use transactions. Now think about what that means, right? Normally when you have transaction demarcation in a Spring application, what happens is we wrap your met your services with an on with a, a proxy that proxy then envelops the method invocation and it stores the current ongoing transaction in a place where the framework can find it before that method begins and then uh it finds that same storage associated with the current ongoing transaction at the end of the method or after the method is completed and then uh it I'd commits it if there have been no exceptions or rolls it back if there have been some exceptions well that's a very natural scheme uh and it conceptually makes a lot of sense but in that world, we're assuming that when you start a method invocation, that that method is going to stay on one thread. The whole scheme relies upon storage of that ongoing transaction living or being associated with the current thread. We use a thread local behind the scenes. Well, this is obviously not going to scale in the wonderful and wild and wacky world of reactive programming, where in the course of a single method, your uh, the flow of execution might very well jump from one thread to another. So to support this use case, uh, Stefan and the, the reactor team built something called the context. So subscriber context. And the context is a, it's a dictionary. It's a key value store for just keys and values. A, one, B, you know, new date, whatever. It's arbitrary data, right? You can put whatever you want in there. But the point is now you can get access to this data during the life of your reactive pipeline. And at any point you can access the, the data through those keys that you gave it. That means that now we can make sure that that context, that instance data, that, that data that's associated with the current ongoing 
uh, transaction that gets propagated from one thread to another, we have a way of propagating that uh, and then you know, uh, making sure that we have it for the life of the pipeline. It doesn't correspond to the life of the method invocation anymore. So that's a very convenient feature. Now, we have data. We have data in the uh, uh, database. We've looked at SQL and NoSQL. We looked at Reactor. We looked at uh, basic spring data usage. Let's build an HTTP endpoint. And of course, here, I could use a reservation REST controller, right? This is a very natural sort of use case here, obviously. Uh, I could do that. And I could uh, create an endpoint at git mapping forward slash reservations and a publisher of reservation like so. And just return this dot reservation positive at find all. And there you go. Bob's your uncle. I have a REST controller. That said, uh, this is the Spring MVC style, right? This is very familiar, I think, if you've ever used Spring MVC. But consider what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to return uh, a reactive stream of reservations given an HTTP GET request to forward such reservations. And given that's my use case, that seems a little verbose. So these days, a lot of times, I'll just start with a new functional reactive style, okay? And that works like this. I just say route dot build dot get forward slash reservations. Okay, new reservations. Now here, I'm going to just have a Lambda and the Lambda is just gonna give me the response that I want. Okay, so server response that okay dot body and I'm going to use a collaborating object, my repository to uh, inject or to rather to look up the data that I want. So here we are, reservation dot class. Okay, so there's the entire pipeline. There's the entire thing. Turn that into a Lambda like so. Uh, use static imports like so, maybe shorten that. And that's my new HTTP endpoint that does exactly the same thing as that 10 line REST controller did before. And it's a, it's a, it's a nice builder API. So I can chain these things uh, together to, you know, to whatever combination or effect I want. I can also use for loops and if and else and all that kind of stuff to dynamically register endpoints. So let's go ahead and restart that and see what we get. Okay. Compiling. You can see that that's the hard part is, is the compilation. Starting up the application these days, not my problem. Not a problem at all. Curl application, localhost, 880 forward slash reservations. Okay, there's my JSON data and there's my eight records in my SQL database. And I can hear you shrug, eh, so what? I could have done that yesterday. Why do I need uh, reactive spring and reactive programming to do uh, what I could have trivially done yesterday using Apache Tomcat and spring MBC as opposed to uh, spring Webflux and uh, Netty, right? Um, or other way around, Netty and spring uh, Webflux. Well, that's a great point. Fair point. What I'm trying to persuade you of, dear friends, not uh, is not that this is inherently uh, uh, that that this inherently opens up more features for you. That's not that is true, but it's not the thing I'm trying to persuade you of right now. We're going to talk about that in just a second. What I want you to see is that we've achieved parity. You can do the things that you were doing yesterday with just as little code as you did it yesterday, and with just as much ease as you did it yesterday. And actually, I would argue even more simplicity than you would, what you would have done yesterday. So let me get rid of this code here. This is a, uh, an initializer that I'm gonna use to write data to the database. You're not gonna do that in production. You're not gonna hard code eight records into production. So there's my real spring application. That's the actual code that I care about right there. That's, that's this thing here. And what is that, you know, seven lines, five lines, uh, six, call it six, seven, eight, and then nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. 17 lines of code to build an application that talks to a SQL data store uh, that uh, uh, has an HTTP endpoint and that does, uh, that, could, that could do transactions and so on. And that's not bad, right? That's, that's really, really, really good. Um, so it's not more code in terms of lines of code. I think we can agree on that. Uh, but it's actually, it's more profound than that. What I've shown you here is one kind of stuff. And that's where the reactive paradigm really comes into its own. So think about uh, how would you do WebSockets today, right? Uh, using non-reactive APIs. How would you do server sent events? How would you do Kafka? How would you do RabbitMQ? How would you do uh, you know, an application JSON REST endpoint or an application XML REST endpoint, right? The APIs for all of these are different. They're different kinds of types, different APIs, different paradigms, all sorts of different ways, especially when it comes to the first several uh, technologies that I mentioned for describing things that produce values asynchronously, right? When you use reactive APIs, you've got one kind of stuff. Sure, the upfront cost of learning how to use reactive streams might be more if you've never used anything that, that at first blush looks uh, vaguely functional, like the Java 8 streams API. If you've never used 
something like that, then of course, learning to use reactive streams will feel a little uh, like an uphill battle at first. I guarantee you uh, that that will quickly subside and amortized over all the possible applications of these reactive APIs, you're going to find that you've actually got much less to learn. Because if you want to do service and events, or if you want to do WebSockets, if you want to use application JSON, or if you want to do XML, or if you want to do Kafka or RabbitMQ, or anything else in the, in the reactive world, you just use a publisher. When you're not sure, you just use a publisher. It makes life considerably simpler. And this, this consistency gives us a few other things. It gives us velocity. It gives us ease of understanding. And much more usefully, it gives us ease of composition. This is a critical ingredient in the microservices world where you want to take data and, and, and aggregate them or scatter gather them and, and, and orchestrate them in different ways. This is where reactive programming really comes into its wheelhouse. It doesn't hurt that these reactive types that we've just looked at are loaded, packed to the gills, brimming with operators that we can use to build more robust uh, calls, to handle kind of uh, all sorts of different failure failure uh, points that we would otherwise have to manually uh, add other libraries to to solve for, right? So we've got now just a simple 8.8 uh, record uh, HTTP endpoint. Um, another thing where reactive programming really comes in to its own is where you're using it to do the kind of work that would have otherwise traditionally required you to keep a thread uh, dedicated to something, okay? So okay, uh, anything that requires liveliness is a good example of this, right? Suppose you wanted to build a, a, a stock ticker application or a chat application or, or anything where you need fresh, lively data. We want the, the freshness of the data to be guaranteed. In this scenario, you are going to want to make sure uh, that uh, you've got a socket uh, connected. You've got a, a, a socket connected to a server socket, and then you're constantly pulling, you're constantly reading. You're saying server socket, you're saying socket that read from the input stream, right? You're, you're, you're asking for the new data in the old world. But you, since you're using input stream, you have to keep a thread open. So of course, you want scalability. But if you have this kind of architecture on the server side as well, that means that your service can only handle as many uh, clients as you can handle threads. And that, that number is very small compared to the number of file descriptors that your operating system can keep open and they can watch for you. So what we want to do is break that link. We want to decouple that interaction. So this is one of the places where reactive programming really comes into its own. Let's create a simple service that'll actually produce a never ending stream of greetings. Okay, just a arbitrary little service that'll create a never ending stream of salutations. And I'm going to create a greeting response, greet, and it'll take a greetings request like so. And this request and response are just DTO types. Okay, so class this, and a, another one here, and here we go. So there's my types, okay? We're gonna have a, a response, and the response will have a message, and the request will have a name, and of course we need data at all args, at no args constructor, at so on. Okay, these are just DTO types that we're gonna use uh, in our application. Good stuff, so now let's actually return a never ending stream. Publisher.fromStream, stream.of, and I'm gonna provide a supplier, and the supplier is just going to produce a never-ending stream of greetings responses, okay? So uh, we're going to use a, 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 a greetings of some sort. So hello, uh, request name at instant dot now, okay? Good. So there's my uh, never-ending stream. Now, of course, if I ran this code as is right now, it would very quickly scroll off the off the screen, down to the floor, and out the door. So what I want to do is I want to stagger uh, each record. I want to say delay the elements by, let's say, one second. That way we have a hope of being able to follow it as it moves uh, down the console. Now, in order to demonstrate this to you, I'm going to create a WebSocket service. So I'm going to create a greetings WebSocket configuration. And it's going to be a regular spring configuration class. And we've got three things we need to make happen. We need to have a uh, mapping between the HTTP uh, server and the WebSocket protocol. So the WebSocket protocol, uh, you know, needs to be upgraded to uh, from the web from the HTTP endpoint. So I'm going to use uh, the WebSocket handler here, uh, handler, handler, and then I'm going to give it a, a, a an ordering. Okay, so map of blah blah blah. Good. So that's all I'm doing is I'm mapping. I'm telling Spring WebFlex to upgrade to that endpoint. The other thing I want to do is I want to create a WebSocket handler adapter. That's just a bit of infrastructure that Spring uh, needs to know to look for WebSocket handlers in the first place, right? So here we go, WebSocket handler, and voila. 
Okay, this is where the business logic actually happens. This is where the rubber meets the road is we're gonna create a web second handler. And in order to create that web second handler, we're gonna use the greeting service. Uh, the contract here is fairly straightforward. It's just a regular uh, HTTP session that gets created or web socket session rather. And we can use the session to ask the server, the client rather, for any data that's coming in from the client. We're gonna get the records, unpack the string of the payload, right? Unpack it as a, as a string payload. And we're gonna take each one of those and turn it into a new greetings request. And we're gonna take each one of those and call the greetings service. So gs.greet.gr. And then we're gonna take each one of those and then uh, take each response, all the, all the responses that come back, the greetings responses, we're gonna get the message. And we're gonna turn each one of those into a WebSocket text message using the builder on the text on the, on the WebSocket session itself, like so. So that's my entire chat, if you will. That's the entire interaction with the WebSocket client. In this case, you can see that the WebSocket client is gonna just send a name. It could send multiple names, it could send just one, uh, but we would do the right thing either way in this case. So finally I'll say session.send and pass in names. That's the entire pipeline. Now, of course, uh, you know, I'm all about that new auto, infer auto type inference. That's nice, I like that a lot. Replace that with a Lambda, that's awesome. So there we go, that's much better. There's my entire WebSocket application. In order to demonstrate this to you, however, I need to do something regrettable, something that I would not do were there any other more expeditious, more elegant way forward. I would that I could, but I can't, so I won't. Instead, I need to write JavaScript. So I've got a static directory, and I'm gonna add a file here called ws.html, HTML, body script and uh, here I'm going to say window dot add event listener uh, load right so I'm going to load I'm going to create a, uh, a lambda that gets called when the con when the window is loaded I'm going to create a new websocket object what is a wave shape or what okay websocket ws local host 8080 forward slash ws greetings and ws at add event listener so when the socket opens I want to then um, send a name in, right? Any name, it doesn't matter. So we're gonna say uh, SF jug, okay? And then add another listener, message, console.log, okay? So it'll be uh, message, message.data. Good stuff, so there's the entire thing, right? Now, let's go ahead and restart this and see what that looks like. localhost ws.html okay open the console there and there you go my friends you can see it's producing data every second in perpetuity and that's okay because in between the raindrops it's not going to uh, keep that thread open it's going to be repurposed for other things in the application that's what we want is we want resource efficiency here this gives us that okay so uh, uh, reactive programming makes life simpler it's a better programming model but it's also a more efficient one here the goal here is not that we get any single one transaction to go faster quite the contrary there might paradoxically be just a tiny smidge of a bit of a delay because of the associated context switching that said we can handle many 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 more transactions that's the win here that's the goal is to handle a lot more transactions with the same uh resources with the same infrastructure so that done, we've got a service, and now I want to build something to talk to it. And you know, it could be another microservice, it could be an edge service, it could be whatever. I'm going to return back to start.spring.io. I'll use uh, that. I'm going to build a edge service here, and we're going to bring in Lumbuck. We're going to bring in R socket. We're going to bring in uh, the reactive web support. Uh, and I think that's it. I think I'm happy. Oh, we want security. Surely we want security as well. Uh, and I think I'm happy with my selections at this point. So we're going to build an edge service. Now, an edge service is typically just that. It's a service that actually, it's another HTTP API. It's another service, uh, and uh, it responds to uh, requests coming in from the outside world. And you could do all sorts of interesting patterns here. I'm not going to create another HTTP API. This will be this will mostly be a client to our service, but you can imagine this taking the place logically of an edge service. Now, in order for this to work, I need to start on some other port. I don't really care which because I'm not going to I'm not going to have an edge service itself. Uh, and there you go. There's our Edge service. Now the application is going to act as a client. Okay, I'm going to act as a client uh, to talk to the uh, to the service that we just created. Okay, so I'm going to create a HTTP client. Okay, return args, and it's going to be an application listener. G K 
Okay, and when the application starts up, in order to do my work, I'm gonna need a reactive non-blocking client. So I'm gonna synthesize one here using the reactive uh, web client, okay? This uh, web client comes from Spring Web Flux. It's a, um, a non-blocking HTTP client. Now keep in mind that Web Flux doesn't care what service it's talking to. It could be something in PHP or Node or Java, or it doesn't have to be reactive. It doesn't have to be Spring, it's just HTTP, right? So you can talk to anything you want. Uh, that said, on the client side, it's not gonna waste resources. So I'm gonna say git dot URI HTTP local host uh, and then 8080 forward slash reservations. Now what I wanna do is I wanna take the data that's coming back from that JSON uh, feed and turn it into a reactive stream of reservations. So I'm gonna go here and take the data, the reservation types, and then log them out, okay? So I'm gonna copy and paste. I'm gonna do something terrible, something that you should never ever do ever when you're at home, all by yourself at home and no one is looking. I am gonna copy and paste. So here's this and that and that. I'll take all of this stuff, go back to my code base, my edge code base here. And I've got them here uh, for as DTOs, if you will. And so now I can say, I want the JSON to be turned into a stream of reservations. And here I could do all sorts of things. I could turn it into, I could adapt the view, right? Uh, I could just take the data and transform it as I want. Uh, and then when I'm finally done with it, I can subscribe and you know just print it out. So uh, system out print line and voila. Okay, there's my reactive HTTP invocation. Now keep in mind, I've made a network call here. Um, up until this point, nothing has happened, right? This is just an interaction that I've created here. I've created a network call, but I'm assuming everything's gonna be okay. That's not a good assumption, right? I should not assume that that downstream service is always gonna be available. First of all, you should consider things like uh, client-side load balancing. Use service registration and discovery. Uh, Spring Cloud Discovery Client gives you that ability so you can do uh, load balancing on the client here to determine which downstream node might be better equipped to handle the request. That's one option. Uh, I'll leave that to your imagination. I've done plenty of videos on that particular topic. But another thing that could go wrong is that uh, we might have to retry, right? We, we might have some error where it's worth retrying. So I can tell it to retry. I can tell it to retry 10 times. I can tell it to retry and use a particular backoff period, right? So I can say attempt it 10 times and then back off one second, right? So lots of different options here. I could also build in some hand handlers here. Uh, when there's an exception. So I can say, when there's an exception, when something goes wrong, uh, provide my default value, okay? Uh, so I'm actually, you know, the, the client, when I when I log out system out print line, what I'll get is not an exception, I'll get eek, right? I'm controlling how we degrade. Another thing I could do is I could use a timeout. A timeout is an interesting option here, but the problem with the timeout is, uh, well, think about it, right? It's a very greedy pattern. It doesn't actually get us what we're trying to get here. What I want to do is I want to make a call to a downstream service and I'm acting on behalf of my client, which has an SLA, right? I have an SLA that I've got to uh, comply with. I'm assuming, I'm, I'm hoping that the thing on which I depend will get me a response within the period of time that I need to get a response to produce a response for my client. If that client is expecting a response in, let's say, some ridiculously indulgent time of a uh, period of time, like 20 seconds, well, I can't, I cannot afford to have a downstream dependency that takes longer than that. In fact, I can't afford to have a downstream dependency that even takes half as long as that. And the reason is because I need time to retry if something goes wrong. So if my client is expecting me to produce a response within 20 seconds, then the service on which I depend has to produce a response in 10 seconds. That way, if something should go wrong, I can just retry one more time. At least then I've got a hope, a prayer of being able to get a response back in time. Well, what happens to the service that it depends on? This, so not the service on which I depend, but the one on, on, on which it depends. Well, that poor service has to produce a response in five seconds. And what about the one that that one in turn depends on? So yeah, you can see the problem. That would have to be 2.5 seconds, right? The numbers and the time out keeps decaying and it becomes very, very hard. It becomes an untenable position just by virtue of the fact that you're three or four hops away from the origin of the request. So we wanna avoid that problem. And we can avoid that by using a, a different pattern here called hedging. Now hedging uh, is a very, very simple pattern. Lots of organizations use it, Netflix for one. Hi, Stefan. Uh, uh, Netflix is one, uh, Google has, talked about their use of it, of course. Uber has talked about their uses of it as well. So lots of different organizations use this. And the idea is simple. Rather than hoping, you know, rather than putting all of your 
hopes and dreams on one network call to one service. Instead, you can have uh, these, you can make the same request identically configured to a number of different host and ports. These host and ports uh, might be identically configured and they're the same service, but one of them is going to give you the response that you want, right? So if I make the same call to, to the same service on three different discrete nodes, maybe one of them is out to lunch, right? Maybe one of them is failing. Maybe one of them is, uh, you know, just not working or it's just coming up or it's just being restarted, whatever. You want to make sure that you get a response back in time. So I'll leave it to your imagination, just to do for now, right? Assuming that you've got something like all this, right? You've got that all there. I'm assuming that one of these is going to be okay. Maybe I called host one. It, it was, uh, it's, it's delayed. Host three is out to lunch, but host two is getting back to me in the timeline that I've, uh, I expected it to. So I get that response and I want to send it back to my client. So what I want to do here is basically a race condition. I want to say, Hey, give me the first response that satisfies my request. This is not a new idea, by the way, if you've ever used uh, the select function in POSIX, then you've no doubt used this pattern before. This is a very simple idea, uh, but it's a little bit more interesting here because I can actually uh, write this code very succinctly using uh, an operator. So I can say host one, host two, host three, right? That gives me the response that I want. The first one to return a byte, uh, first one to produce a value, I get to keep that one. The other ones are, uh, they, they have back pressure that's applied to them, okay? How convenient for us. It's very, very convenient. So I can say first, uh, that gives me the response, and then I can send that back to my client, right? Think about how you would do this if you didn't have reactive APIs. This would be, this, is an, this falls into the category of things that you would not want to do without reactive code. It would be super hard. What I've done here is I've essentially created a race condition. I'm hoping that I catch one of them faster than the other one, right? Uh, that's exactly not the kind of code you want to write. Imagine the cyclic barriers and countdown latches and, and so on that you would have to do to get this right. I don't want to worry about that code, and I don't think you do either. Remember, friends, there's only one person who truly, truly, truly understands how to write multi-threaded Java code, and it's not you. It doesn't matter who it is. It's not you. That's the point here, my friends. This is not a message of hope. Use the framework. Let the framework do this terrible work for you so that you can get, the, get onto the business of getting software into production. So I am going to use this pattern. Obviously, you should only use this pattern for endpoints that are idempotent. That is to say, don't use this on the charge the customer credit card endpoint. That's not going to go so well. Nobody's going to be happy with that result. So uh, avoid, right? Don't, don't, and if you do do that, don't say that Josh said, I can do this. It's fine. Uh, don't, don't do that, okay? Um, only for idempotent endpoints. That is to say, endpoints that, are, uh, that you can call multiple times without any undue uh, observable uh, side effects, okay? So that's one pattern that you can do. And um, there's all sorts of other things that you can do here, right? I've got a reactive stream, right? I've, I've got this reactive stream here. This whole thing is a reactive stream, right? It's a publisher of strings. And then I can say timeout like so, right? I can do that if I want. Names. Names, okay? Now, I've got a stream. Um, the nice thing about this is, remember, until I call subscribe, nothing has happened. I haven't actually seen any bytes cross the network. Nothing has happened here. And yet, I, I can change things. You, I made the request, I defined the shape of the request, I defined the pipeline through which data will flow, but I haven't actually defined, uh, I haven't actually turned on the, 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 the water, if you will, I haven't turned on the faucet. And so I've got pipes that are connected together, but I haven't turned on the water to flow through the pipes. And that's okay, I can keep modifying this pipeline as much as I want. It all gets assembled into a final thing, and only then do we get uh, the ability to actually get our bytes across the wire. And that only happens on subscribe, which could happen an hour later, right? You might define this now and then subscribe might happen next week. We don't know. The point is you have plenty of time between defining the request and actually executing it, assembly time versus execution time, where you can change the assembly. And we use this to great effect here in, for example, the uh, first operator, right? This is a really interesting trick because you can change how these things are processed. Uh, this means that uh, you can actually, um, uh, define pipelines and kind of line them up in a certain in a certain way, and then they just get executed, and they in turn can cascade to other pipelines and so on. And you don't have to worry about that; it's just done for you automatically. Um, so, an example: uh, suppose I have two different endpoints, and I want to get uh, data from one and from the other. So, publisher of string one equals null, publisher of integer e uh, two equals null. And I'll do, again two do okay. So one two. What I get back from this is a tuple, right? So I can actually say for each element coming from the first stream and for each one coming the second one, capture them and then create a tuple 
and the t1 of that tuple is going to be a string, and t2 will be an integer. So I'm actually emitting uh, the whole thing uh, based on the, in, the constituent parts. And remember, this is executing in concurrent. In concurrent. So I, I, I can actually do scatter gather kinds of operations like this. This is such a useful thing. There's even a, a third party project has nothing to do with us that I quite like called assembler. And the assembler has a number of different implementations, one of which is for project reactor. So reactor, uh, this, this uh, assembler project gives you a DSL for designing uh, service orchestration kind of uh, uh, you know, uh, arrangements, right? You can create an assembler of a logical type. This is your type. It's not when it, when they say transaction. That's a bit of an unfortunate misnomer. It's not a framework class called transaction. It's your you know shopping cart order or line item or whatever you want, right? It's anything like that. And then you can say I, I want to create an assembler of this, which has a number of relationships whose correlation key is the customer ID. And then I describe the one to one relationship by using the reactive stream, producing a billing info for customers, matching on billing info for customer ID, and I get the uh, one to many list using all the orders for customers using the customer ID as the billing as, as a correlation ID and so on very very natural thing to do very easy to do uh, and it's also the most concurrent most efficient thing to do you don't have to write a single line of threading code to get that result okay so I've got my reactive application uh, I've got my data in my um, I've got the uh, data here let's log it out and see what we get now next I'm gonna want to create a uh, um, I like that I have HTTP, but what I want to do is I want to actually look at the results in a little bit more of an expected way. B name. Oh, I've got two. Uh, yeah, fair enough. HTTP client listener, and voila. Okay, there you go. So there's there's the data. Now I like HTTP. I believe it's got a future. That said, it's a great document retrieval protocol. I don't really believe it's the best protocol for building uh, services. For interaction, for interactive services, there are a lot of things for which HTTP just isn't ideal. It's not, it's not perfect. So suppose uh, I wanted to build an HTTP service uh, that's, um, or so, suppose I wanted to build a service that did bi-directional communication, right? It's not really a thing with HTTP. It's a request response oriented protocol. Even HTTP uh, 2.0 is request response oriented, right? It's, it doesn't, uh, once you're connected, one thing has to initiate the conversation, that's the client. And then from there, the service can produce responses as often as it wants. It's porous, at least when you're using HTTP 1.x, uh, it's text-based, right? So not very efficient over the wire, uh, not very compressed uh, friendly, not, not, you know, not very uh, easy to compress. So that's a problem. And also other message exchange patterns like fire and forget uh, are just not, they're just simply not possible, right? So these are, this causes problems. We could use other things like uh, gRPC. gRPC is a asynchronous but not reactive by default uh, approach to building services from Google. Uh, it builds on HTTP2 and it, it uses a uh, pipelining, which is nice, uh, but still some limitations. It's also it's also requires you to have a Google Protocol Bus, so everything must be in terms of a Google Protocol Bus uh, endpoint. Our payload rather in and uh, service endpoint. So I like it, but uh, could we do better? I think so. So there's a protocol called RSocket. Now RSocket is the work of some engineers that came from uh, Netflix that went to to uh, Facebook, and there they created this protocol where uh, it's natively reactive on the wire. It understands back pressure on the wire at the wire level. This makes it an ideal candidate for us to build reactive services. And uh, when they built this protocol. Uh, they built in some things that are just kind of obvious when you think about it. Things like message headers. Now, uh, message headers are super important. They give you out of band information about the payload that's being conveyed or conducted. Well, think about it. Web sockets don't have that, right? So it just seems like such an obvious thing when I say it, but so much of the HTTP and the HTTP browser centric world just isn't meant for services, right? How can you propagate tokens uh, or, or you know security uh, credentials, right? That kind of thing if you don't have headers. So this kind of stuff is. Uh, it's a, it's, we can get around it, but it's just not great. With, with RSocket, it's a first class concept. So what I want to do is I want to go back to my service and I want to build a service out of this, an RSocket service out of this greeting service. Now, don't blink. If you're up getting coffee, you're going to miss it. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, change this at service into a controller and annotate this endpoint with a message mapping endpoint. And I'm gonna give it a string, kind of like a URI, but it's not, right, it's, a, it's an endpoint, there you go. And that's my RSocket service, that's it, that's all I need to do. You see, when Facebook uh, built uh, the 
the reactive Java client, and there are a number of different implementations, right? There's, uh, there's JavaScript and C++ and Go and a bunch of others, but when they built the Java one, they used Reactor. So that meant that it's super easy for us to plug it in to a um, Spring Framework application, especially if we've got a Reactor at the base layer of all of our reactive APIs. So we went one step further in Spring Framework 5.2, which Peter correctly uh, noted earlier, uh, and added support for our socket. And we did that uh, uh, so that you don't even have to do anything. Like I'm just using regular annotations. The only thing you need to do in Spring Boot is to tell which port you want to start the R socket service on. So let's go ahead and uh, make sure that's up and running. Sometimes it doesn't restart. And then later on, I built the client and it's like, oh, why isn't it working? Well, it's because it never restarted. Okay, good. So now here on the edge service, on the other thing, the client, if you will, I'm going to create another application listener. Listen for an application ready event. Uh, client listener. And here I'm going to use something called an R socket requester. So in the R socket world, there's no such thing as client service. You have a uh, requester responder. Okay. So uh, it, it's a, it's a distinction without a difference, I suppose at some point, but what it means is once they're connected, once either side is connected to the other, they stay connected for the life of the application, right? So one service will connect to another service when they start up and they'll stay that way for the entire life of the application. And once they're connected, either side can send a request at any time, right? That's, that's what you need to understand. And so uh, we're gonna build a um, RSocket endpoint here, RSocket call using the RSocket requester. So we're gonna say uh, requester, requester dot route greetings dot and then here, I'm gonna say that the data that I wanna send in is a new greetings request uh, and uh, it'll be SF jug. And the data that I wanna get back is a greetings response dot class. And then all I wanna do is log out the results, system out print line, okay? So there's the data, it's a very simple call. Um, now we need to actually define the RSocket uh, requester itself, just like we defined the web client here. So RSocket requester, okay, requester, RSocket requester dot, Builder, builder, return, builder dot. And then here I'm gonna do connect TCP localhost 8888 dot block, okay? So that's the entire connection, that's the entire application. Let's go ahead and try that out and see what we get. Oops, I need to do this. Okay. Cool. So there we go, my friends. Every second in perpetuity, forever, never, never, you're gonna see the results uh, trickle out on the console there. And that's okay, that's what we want, right? I'm actually reactively sending data from one node to another using our socket. And I've also made a reactive HTTP client call. Now, keep in mind, with HTTP, we don't have true reactivity. The absolute best case scenario, if I have a reactive service, uh, an a reactive HTTP service, and I have a client that disconnect, is that the reactive HTTP service perceives the disconnect and then applies back pressure to all the things that were upstream of it that were being used to produce a response for the HTTP client. But the client can't then resume. There's no way for it to come back an hour later and say, hey, I'd like to keep going. Let's kick off where we left off. You either get the data or you don't, right? You connect or you disconnect. Uh, uh, there's no way to do that. It's not truly reactive on the wire, right? With our socket, that's not true. I can actually just not request any more data. I'm still connected. And if I want to come back an hour later, I can try again. I can resume. I can keep that context. Okay. So, I have an HTTP service and I have an RSocket service. I like both of these protocols. I think they're, uh, you know, I, I can see that HTTP is gonna be a thing that you're gonna use on the open web, of course. Uh, that said, I would, I would be hard pressed to find a use case for which RSocket, at least internally, wasn't the better choice. One of the things that people ask about is, well, what about security? How do I do security? Well, we can use Spring Security. Spring Security works out of the box. It's just a, it's a very easy thing uh, to use. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use Spring Security to secure our application, both our HTTP service and our R socket service. And in order to do that, I'm going to create, <clears throat> I'm going to create, uh, I'm gonna worry about uh, a few things here. I'm gonna worry about authentication and authorization. Okay, so security, security configuration. Now uh, authentication answers the question, uh, who is making the request? Authorization answers the question, what permissions or privileges do they have once they're inside the system? Okay, so uh, I'm gonna unlock my dependencies here. Okay, good. 
Good, good. So now I've got these dependencies and I'm gonna create an authentication service. Now keep in mind when you, when you use uh, Spring Security in an authentication context, you have to keep in mind a few important details here. Uh, what happens when you do using password-based authentication? For example, let's suppose I wasn't using an in-memory uh, database full of usernames and passwords here. Let's suppose I was uh, talking to a username and password database table. Well, when a request comes in, say uh, from a HTTP client, it's got a username and password in the body of the request. I need to take that password, you know, HTTP basic or a, a multi-part form uh, uh, submission or whatever. I want to take that password in the body of the request. I need to then encrypt it, right? I can't. I'm hopefully, knock on wood, hopefully you're not storing your usernames and passwords in the database unencrypted. I hope you're doing the right thing there. So uh, I need to encrypt it, okay? Um, I need to encrypt it by running an encryptor. Well, that, that's cryptography, right? I, I need to use a password encryptor from Spring Security. That's cryptography. Cryptography happens on the CPU and there's no way to rub reactive on that and make it faster. It's just gonna take the time it takes. The default uh, encryption mechanism that we use in Spring Security is bcrypt. We support like 10 of them, but that's the one we use out of the box. Um, and that's a very good way to in encrypt your data and to encrypt your passwords, but it takes time. The stronger the, pa the, the strength of the password, the longer the time it's gonna take for encryption. And that's a feature, not a bug. That said, you need to be well aware of the fact that you may have some things in your application that block, and when you block, you, you know, you risk uh, blocking on a thread that's being used by something uh, in the system. So you need to be very clear about blocking on separate thread pools. You can do that by saying, I wanna subscribe on, and then passing in a custom scheduler, right? Schedulers dot from whatever, or Elastic, or whatever. You can provide your own custom uh, uh, thread pool there. Uh, by default, the scheduler that we have uh, does one thread per core. Now a scheduler is one half clock, one half thread pool, okay? So that just does, the work of moving the flow of execution from one thread to another, that's there behind the scenes. If for whatever reason, you have some code that's blocking, you need to find it and isolate it onto its own thread pool. We have given you a Java agent that you can use called Blockhound. You add it to the class path and do blockhound.install. And then anytime you do something silly like thread.sleep, it'll throw an exception and you can then perceive that in your logs. So it's a great thing to have uh, when you're developing and testing the application, especially. Now, uh, I have, I've got a service, we're, yeah, back to the service, here we go, demo. And in the service, I want to do uh, authentication, I've done that. I also want authorization. So let's do uh, the HTTP endpoint first. HTTP server uh, uh, security web filter chain, HTTP, right? And server HTTP security, okay? So I'm gonna say um, HTTP authorization http dot uh, build. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that any request needs to be authenticated. So authorize exchange AE, AE dot any exchange authenticated. I want to disable HTTP basic. I want to enable it. So I'm going to say enable with the defaults, but I want to disable CSRF. Okay. So X, X dot disable. Okay. There you go. That's my basic uh, HTTP interaction on the service side. I also want to do the same thing for our socket. Okay, so here I'm gonna use the uh, payload socket acceptor interceptor. Okay, and this is my R socket authorization. R socket authorization. And the names I wanna remind you are utterly and completely arbitrary. Okay, R socket uh, security. R socket, R socket. Okay, so I'm gonna say return R socket dot uh, build authorize payload AP, AP dot in exchange authenticated. Uh, I'm going to then, I think I'm going to leave everything as is, right? Oh, I want simple authentication as well. I'm going to enable that. That's kind of like HTTP basic. And by the way, there's support for JWT, JWT for both R socket and for HTTP. So you can do, uh, there's a meta endpoint. Is it up here? Jot. Oh, OAuth, you do the OAuth bit there, right? So you have support for uh, jot, you have support for tokens, uh, token-based authentication in both. So that's the authorization. Now that said, I also wanna change my code a little bit because I'm gonna have that authenticated principle that's going to come in and I wanna be able to use that. So I'm gonna enable uh, uh, the ability of the, I'm, I'm gonna enable a part of the programming model uh, by registering an RSocket message handler, 
Okay, so R socket message handler. And this R socket message handler is going to rely on the R socket strategies. Okay. So I'll say return strategies. And here, var mh equals new R socket message handler. mh dot get argument resolver add new uh, authentication. There you go. And mh dot um, set R socket strategy equals strategies and return mh. Okay, so that's the R second message handler. <clears throat> and then with that done, with that done, I can now go back to my uh, R socket code here in the service. Where did I put it? It's uh, here somewhere, surely. There you go. I can change this code. I'm going to change this a little bit so that instead of taking a greetings request, I'll take an authenticated user. So the name will come from the authenticated principle uh, instead of the, um, the uh, payload of the body. Okay, so authenticated principle mono of user details okay user and this will go up here and return uh user dot map ud ud dot get name and then i'm going to take that name turn it into a new greetings request okay passing that in i'm going to call it flat map uh gr I'm going to call this dot greet gr. Okay, so there's the entire thing. Oh, what is this? That's where the confusion lays. Good. Flat map. Did I do something wrong? So let's see. I've got a map. What does that give me here? Map gives me a mon. Oh, okay, yeah, it's flat map mini. I want that. Flat map mini greetings request. Uh, and then I'm gonna call this dot greet GR. What's the issue with that one? Oh, response. I'm getting a, a stream of greetings response. Of course. Okay, there you go. There's the entire pipeline. That can be this, like so, and this can be that. Very good. Okay, so there's now my authenticated endpoint, right? I'm actually injecting the authenticated principle. Uh, with that, I can restart the service. Let's make sure it's restarted. Sometimes it doesn't, you can see it's stuck here. Restart. Okay, now on the client side, I wanna authenticate. So for the HTTP side, that's pretty easy. Uh, say private final string user equals jlong. Private final string pw equals pw. And I'm going to uh, create a few things that I need. I need a mime type. Okay, so equals mime type utils dot parse. Uh, and then we want um, the uh, uh, well known. What I'm trying to do is I'm, I'm, I need to configure the well known mime type from our socket. Okay, so well known mime type dot uh, authentication dot get string. And I also want to configure uh, the metadata. So credentials, so private final username, password, metadata, credentials equals new this dot user, this dot PW, okay? Um, and that's it, that's the, uh, the variables I need. Now I can actually use that uh, to configure a few things. For HTTP, couldn't be simpler. I'm gonna configure a filter, exchange filter functions dot, okay, dot basic authentication, this dot user, this dot password. And then for our socket, I need to configure uh, the security at one of two places or both, it doesn't really matter. I can configure uh, the security either when the, the socket is first established, right? So set up metadata, and that's uh, the, uh, the credentials and the MIME type, right? That's one thing I need. Um, and then, or I could do that metadata on the invocation itself, right? So if you have one connection being used to represent all users and there's no user context associated with each transaction, then you can just do it at the beginning, at the connection. On the other hand, if you're doing it, if you have multiple users that are using the same socket, uh, then you wanna actually customize it. You wanna send the data there uh, accordingly. So this dot credentials uh, and this dot mime type, right? Same idea. So it's setup metadata versus metadata, but either way, you're fine. You're welcome to do that. The only other thing we need is we need to customize how we're encoding uh, our, our, our security here, right? 
our simple uh, security. So I need to create an RSocket strategies customizer. I'm going to customize the RSocket strategies themselves, uh, and that'll in turn, um, you know, that'll in turn give me the opportunity to uh, plug in a custom encoder. So strategies dot encoder new simple authentication encoder. Okay, so now I think that's it, my friends. I think we've got everything we need. Let's go ahead and give it a shot, huh? Okay, usernames and passwords uh, for, we got the data, we got the HTTP protected data there, and we got the uh, username back from us. So it's clearly been able to go to the service, give us the data, and then print it out. My friends, I hope you got something out of this. I hope you learned something new. I'm happy to answer questions now. We, we've only covered just a little bit. I wish we had more time. Obviously, if we had more time, we could have talked about Spring Cloud Gateway. If we had more time, we could have talked about um, uh, Kafka and messaging. If we had more time, we could have talked about the support and for RSocket and for reactive publishing and spring integration. If we had more time, my friends, we talk about so much more, but I'm afraid we're just about out of time. Uh, we covered uh, Growl VM, we looked at uh, native images, we looked at some of the new features in Spring Boot 2.3, we looked at Reactor, we looked at how to build Spring Boot applications, uh, we looked at Java uh, uh, as a language, you know, from Java 14, we talked about that briefly. We looked at reactive pipelines, we looked at Project Reactor, we looked at Spring Data for SQL and NoSQL, we looked at functional uh, reactive HTTP endpoints versus uh, risk controller style endpoints. We looked at WebSockets. We looked at building clients. We looked at patterns for service orchestration and composition for things like hedging and retries and, and so on. Uh, we looked at our socket. We looked at security. We looked at all the concerns that are uh, that apply to um, uh, cryptography when you're doing reactive applications. Uh, and we've just begun to scratch the surface. There's so much more out there, and I hope you'll uh, give it a shot. Now, I'm going to stop sharing and uh, look at the questions if I can see them. You know you covered a lot when the summary takes three minutes. Well, yeah, it's we got some of them. We got that some is, questions in there. That is impressive. Um, I think one of the ones I would draw your attention to, my friend, would be, uh, well, Stefan already answered it, but um, you know, I think it might be well, a good opportunity to elaborate a little bit on, uh, you know, what happens if you are mixing and matching, right? Um, I think this is an opportunity to sort of speak about the transition path that has very, been very carefully engineered into things like Spring MVC, where you can kind of mix and match Flux, Mono, and you know REST templates, right. and other like data types. Um, the question literally was, how does Web Flux and Spring Web exist together? If one were tra uh, to transition an existing application, is that even advisable? Yeah, so you can actually run, great question, I think, so, uh, you can run Spring MVC and Tom, and you can do reactive code on top of Tomcat. Uh, but keep in mind, it's not going to be full blown, right? So not what we're doing is we're delegating to the underlay, underlying layer. And so uh, I guess there are some parts of the API that don't support true reactivity. So all we can do is the best faith, best uh, effort sort of um, uh, thing there, right? Uh, but you can do that. That's It's not going to give you some of the same scalability benefits as using Netty might, I would, I would guess. but uh, it's certainly a supported option. As to taking existing code that's just written for Spring MVC and making it work, mm, yeah, that's not going to be 100%. That's not a drop and replacement by, you know. But I, on the other hand, I mean, Stefan, does it, does it work that I can just return like a, a, I can return a collection from a Spring MVC, or sorry, a Spring Webflux uh, endpoint, for example? Couldn't I? Yeah, 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 yeah. You, can, you can return any in-memory type, like uh, even a string or, whatever you, you want to return. The only constraint is, um, um, and that's the main problem in general with the reactive types, is that you must not work on the blocking API. So if you yeah. if you were to do rest template dot get in your controller method, yeah, that's where problems start to, to pile. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, you. Yeah, there you go. Did somebody suggest that? Oh, that's it. I'm leaving. Somebody said Java user group has become the JavaScript user group. Dot dot dot. Reactive. You troll. You troll. <laughs> um. Okay. We hold have on. more than one thread. We have another couple of questions that are just coming up now. But let me just go back in the in the history and make sure I didn't miss anything for a second. I think we got the uh, 
spring boot jar size question. Thanks for that, uh, Stefan. Appreciate that. Yeah, uh, I think it was a question about Oracle and what they're doing with JDBC, which is probably still nothing. Um, and why do we, you know, what's the point of, of creating a reactive JDBC driver to a non-reactive database? Um, you know, kind of to Stefan's point about making blocking calls inside of async code, sort of the same thing at the end of the day. Right. Uh, more recently, we have uh, a question from Eduardo. Um, when you're testing your flow using step verifier and your code uses, for example, zip that runs stuff in parallel, how do you keep your test running in the same thread? Uh, he had issues to change the operators to, to sequential stuff using then, uh, dot then, and etc. Uh, Stefan, I... Uh... I'm glad you're here, bud. Sorry, I'm reading the question. Yeah, it might it might be easier. This one might be easier to read than to dictate. Um, it's about step verifier. Uh, that feels like um, very specific. I think the best place to answer this kind of question. Um, if I may share a link or two. One is uh, Git chat. So if you go to guitar.im dot slash reactor slash reactor like this, um, you will be you will find uh, more than one thousand people uh, around uh, talking about reactor. So uh, that's the community chat we have for the, the reactive stuff. Um, I know there are issues about running stuff in parallel with step verifier, but uh, I don't know. I need to um, I need to see actual code, and I think uh, writing code on Zoom is not going to cut it. It's not yeah. the best UI ever, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, I've got another good question from Prashant. Um, so he says, when fibers become a real thing, has work already begun in Reactive Spring Team to support that, or is it a completely different approach to code? Is fibers some native threads thing redone again, still? Like, what is, I haven't heard of fibers, but it sounds suspiciously like native threads. It's suspiciously, uh, uh, it's actually the, the name for uh, Project Loom and what's coming in uh, maybe Java 17. Oh, got it. Oh, Loom. Yeah, yeah. Okay, got it. It got a new name while I wasn't looking. Cheers. And uh, to answer that question, I, it's funny because I had, uh, well, we regularly have this question. I had this discussion this morning with another big user of reactive stuff, um, PayPal. And they, um, so the answer to uh, what's going to come with Project Loom, um, well, remember what I said about using blocking APIs inside your uh, reactive application is a no-no and that's actually one of the main difficulties with adopting reactive APIs because uh, you have legacy libraries you need to integrate with and you don't know if they are blocking or not. Uh, we have a tool for uh, you to help detecting this thing, it's called BlockHound, but in general it's just a pain in, in the ass um, to integrate these uh, legacy libraries. Well, with Project Loom, it's not going to be a pain as much because supposedly um, calls like socket.read, uh, input stream, file API, all of these uh, blocking calls in terms of uh, uh, coding the system stack and, and you know, doing IO work and this kind of thing, um, blocking the actual thread, they're going to be non-blocking. They're going to suspend the thread and, and they're going to be wake, waken uh, only open when they, um, when the, the the IO has finished processing whatever it was uh, going to do, so Project Loom is going to be very uh, cool to to work with in the future. There's no specific work we need to 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 do, uh, but running on a you know Java 17 when it's going to get out, if it's uh, coming with Java 17, um, I think it's um, yeah it's a good combination with uh, what we have. If you want to take a, a good comparison point, look at what they've did, they've done on Kotlin and with coroutines. So 
cutting came with coroutines. It's great. Uh, you do a lot of stuff already with them, but that didn't prevent them to create a functional API um, kind of like stream uh, or flux. And they called it flow because if you want to work on a collection of data, um, it still seems to have a lot of benefit to use a functional API and, and you know, instead of using the nested kind of uh, uh, Russian doll of I do a for, inside I do a if, inside I do a, a, a transformation, I prefer to uh, reason my code, my concurrent code in, in terms of step like what Josh um, showed earlier. So there is a lot of um, things to say about uh, functional API. And the last thing I would say about Project Loom, um, Project Loom doesn't solve everything. So one thing is uh, how do you cancel uh, a synchronous task? Well, with uh, Reactor, we've seen that there, there is a protocol behind where you can call sub, um, a subscription.cancel. Obviously with the API we provide, you can do things like, uh, hey, let me take the, f the free first element. And then after that, I will cancel my, uh, whatever I was doing, uh, the, the flux I was consuming. This kind of uh, primitives don't come with uh, um, Project Loom. So there, is, there will still be a need to, to, to use kind of a higher level of abstraction on top of it. But I'm really looking forward to uh, um, Project Loom in, in general to actually ease the adoption of uh, reactive stuff. Yet there may be a last um, benefit I, I can, kind of see, um, especially for future version of Reactor and, and Webflux, might be to, um, it might be possible with Project Loom to reduce the stack traces, which is famously known to be kind of long um, in functional programming. Um, with Project Loom, we might actually have a shot at just drastically reduce the, the stack traces, but we'll see because um, for now it comes with significant performance drawbacks so it's still better to use something like Reactor, RxJava, or ArcaStream than Project Loom. That's it, my friend. I hope that, that answers your question. Great answer. Yeah, he, he's saying yes in the chat. And yep, looks like Loom will make reactive executions faster. There's no threat switch is happening. Um, another question from Eduardo. Uh, if I want to use RxJava instead of Reactor, uh, what would I change in the spring configuration? Is it fully compatible? Isn't it based on RxJava 2? Was, wasn't it RxJava 2 compatible, Stefan? Uh, it's a quick history lesson. Yeah. Uh, yeah. RxJava, RxJava 2 and Reactor are actually the same original code. We worked with the RxJava 2 lead, David Karnock, when we created Reactor 3 and, and RxJava 2 actually in the same project. Um, but Rx Java 2 diverged because they needed to maintain Java 6 compatibility. Um, Rx Java 2 is 70% uh, Android developers. So you can kind of, kind of understand why they needed the Java 6 compatibility um, to you know, get a lot of uh, user on Android. So that's why they diverged and now they maintain their own uh, independent state. Uh, what I like to say about Reactor versus uh, Rx Java, um, first we continue collaborating. I'm still talking to, at this day actually, uh, on, on this day, I'm still talking to David Carnock and we synchronize on issues. Um, but what I like to say about Reactor is it's kind of the enterprise Rx Java. We have added, um, you know, non-functional requirements like insight, uh, logging, the subscriber context thing, um, that's, that's necessary if you want to do like uh, security and uh, tracing and this kind of thing, the non-functional requirements, things that you don't need necessarily when you write an Android application reacting to, e reacting to events and, and doing your UI stuff, but that you need when you write a Spring backend service, um, basically. So that's the route uh, Reactor is going and Rx Java is, it's still innovating on a lot of things, but it's not going the route of, uh, you know, providing this extra stuff. Some say enterprisey stuff, but I think it's just, uh, you know, backend kind of uh, stuff, you know. Um, and I didn't answer the, the question actually, which is, uh, are they compatible? Um, yes, they are, because they implement the same type, uh, the same reactive streams type coming with the reactive streams jar. It's called Publisher. So, 
uh, for instance, in Eric Java, you do a flat map uh, with Flowable, and inside you have to return a publisher. Well, you can return flux.just. It's, it's combining all together. That's the, the mega point, the meta point of uh, uh, having a specification. You could even do that with ACA streams, for instance, or other implementer of uh, uh, reactive streams. I am going to, uh, there was a question that was asked to me uh, privately, but I'm going to repeat it because it is the, uh, an elephant in the room. Um, thank you, Alan. I hope I'm saying your name correctly. Uh, I got a question basically saying, hey, I'm using database Wumpty Wump, in his case or her case, uh, in FluxDB. Uh, you know, does Spring Boot provide a reactive way to get the data? And I think, um, I think the answer is that uh, R2DBC, you know, will meet, if, you prov if that database vendor provides a, a reactive Java driver, um, you can, you should be able to plug that into R2DBC, which I believe would have Spring Boot support. Um, I don't know what the requirements for the driver are. Maybe Stefan or Josh can speak to that a little bit, but I think that's the sort of, you know, uh, snap together model, <laughs> you know, that you would, that you'd be looking at. So uh, just to, uh, uh, just to clear a confusion about R2DBC, it's only about uh, plugging into SQL backends. Um, for NoSQL databases, we, most of the time we already have asynchronous drivers provided by, by the vendors like Elastic or, or Coachbase or whatever. Oh, good. And, oh, so it's just about relational. Okay. Got yeah, it. it's just about relational databases. Thanks for that. Um, and FluxDB, I don't know if the, I, I don't think there is a Spring Data project for it, but if there is, and if Mflux, uh, DB provides a, a driver, an asynchronous driver, which most of the time nowadays um, vendors do, uh, it's only a, it's more the minority nowadays and relational databases that don't, that prov not providing, that are not providing um, um, an asynchronous driver, but if they do, it's easy to plug in a uh, reactor in that case. Yeah, he mentioned uh, InfluxDB was, you know, had a um, beta version uh, reactive driver. So if, if they do have a reactive driver though, to get to it through Spring Boot, there would need to be Spring Data Repository support for it, or they would have to use the straight GDBC calls directly, question mark. Well, I'm, I'm not too familiar with uh, uh, how you consume MflexDB on, in Java. I don't think you use JDBC drivers at all in that case. I just, they probably have their own API. Um, yeah. Spring, I don't think there is a, oh, they might actually be a, they might have a Spring Boot de, a recommended dependency on, on things with MflexDB because there is a micrometer support for that. Um, so, so they might have some something, but I'm not familiar enough to to say yeah, they, yeah. they have a okay, project no for that. I, I don't think there's a, a. I'm checking right now, real quick, but I don't think there's a Spring Data uh, Influx DB. Uh, I'm just checking real quick. Um, a good example. It is, for it's a community project um, and not supported by the mainline. Um, yeah. Uh, looks like there's some open source out there, maybe. I mean, if it, if it supports asynchronous I/O, it can be made to work with Reactive. It's just I don't yeah. know if it's done already. Yeah, it doesn't look like it. I'm just uh, triple checking the um, Spring Data like sort of manifest, as it were. Um, I don't see a community project listed for it. Uh, to be honest, yeah, no, I'm not seeing that. So it's not part of the um, it's not part of the core release train for Spring Data, nor is it a um, community project that that the Spring team is willing to sort of you know. So there is, but well, we we do have a, a micrometer binding for it, so you can talk to InfluxDB from uh, our observability right. stuff, right? right? But that's not reactive. I'm just and it's not a data store. If anyway, we don't need to get wrapped. We don't need to get wrapped around the axle on this one specific example. I think the uh, I think that the general sort of view of the industry and where they are with reactive drivers and how that relates to R2DBC slash Spring Boot is really the sort of meta question. Mm -hmm. um, cool. Yeah. And it also seems like MflexDB provides a RX Java 2 driver. So there you go. It's pretty easy to plug in. Uh, yeah, he said it was uh, in beta, uh, in, in beta version or something. He said for version two, I think. But anyway, 
Mm -hmm. uh, Jeff Williams asks, uh, Josh, have you used the Salesforce reactive gRPC? <laughs> Yikes. Yeah, this, that's, it's based on reactor. They did a talk, uh, at spring one too. That's really? Cool. Did they? Uh, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. That's based on uh, reactor project reactor. So that's an option, but there's still the fundamental limitations of gRPC itself that get in the way. It's not just the, um, uh, the lack of a driver. Although with that, there, and by the way, what that is, it's a ProTalk compiler plugin. So it's basically a plugin for the compiler that turns your service definitions into Java classes. And instead of turning them into asynchronous completion stage based services, it turns it into reactor based services. Got it. Uh, so that's okay. kind of interesting. That, the, that's nice. You know, his, his questions, his question was kind of like about how it compares to our socket, but not like the protocol. Uh, more the yeah. development model and a programming model about using them with Webflux and Reactor, um, if you happen to use it, it. So the result from that is you get a class that returns publishers. Uh, and so you can use that from, you can just import that, you can add it to the class path of your code and just use it like anything else, but it's not gonna be, it, you generate the services from the service, service ideal. You create a gRPC uh, service definition file and that gets code generated into Java code as opposed to what I just did here, where I just wrote the Java code and it was far less con convoluted, you know? Do you, uh, if I may uh, add on, on yeah. the, the, the question, um, on how does it compare to our socket in terms of experience? Um, the Spring team has built uh, a full vertical experience around our socket. So you have security, sure. you have uh, insights, you have uh, Webflux with a specific companion object like uh, also get requester, also get um, receiver. So a bunch of yeah. things built on top of that. And the reason is that um, also get is much less opinionated. It's pretty bare bone compared to uh, gRPC, which is a uh, very high level. Uh, in, if you compare the level of abstraction, gRPC is more like out of the box working and providing a lot of things and even a programming model, which is um, this product thing where you generate your stuff. It's contract driven and that's it. Also, CAD is not contract driven. You can make it, uh, but it's not. It's message based. And uh, because of that, it's much easier for Spring to, it was more natural for Spring to build on top of that. That and the fact that obviously there is some history um, between this project and, and Reactor. Um, so, what I want to say is as of now, in, the developer experience is much. Uh, better with uh, Spring and also get But we we do have a regular ask, and I, I know the team has a, still has this kind of regular ask. We're asking that ourselves from Netflix to, to the Spring team, um, that we support more of the gRPC stuff in Spring. There are interesting projects already around, but um, I, I hope we, we can learn from what we've we've got already with our socket to apply some of that into um, the gRPC stuff. What I hope in particular is that we have an annotation model we can share between, um, you know, the R socket stuff and the gRPC stuff. So we have a, a consistency and we use the same pattern. That, that would be pretty, that would be very spring-like and pretty slick if that was yep. possible. Um, that's intriguing. It would uh, just uh, actually for my own edification, if you wouldn't mind uh, me wedging in one question myself, um, what, what are some of the greatest, if you could give me like a very brief summary, not a super detailed answer, but just, you know, what are some of the highlights in your opinion about, you know, the protocol comparison? Because, you know, on the face of what you just said, right? I think many developers would choose a higher level programming model unless they absolutely needed the, you know, the knobs and dials that, that, are, that are available at a lower level. Uh, so given that, you know, what, is there something sort of that makes it a little more worth it, you know, at the protocol level with our socket versus what's, you know, what's the trade off for that of the lower level programming model? That's a good, good question. I think, um, uh, the, the lower level of programming model gives you so much opportunities to plug in um, the protocol wherever you want. So gRPC is tied to HTTP2. Uh, you, you can have bridges with uh, WebSocket, but it, it was designed to be associated with HTTP2. Uh, also, get works on top of TCP, uh, HTTP1 with WebSocket, soon H2, 
uh, because now we support H2 in, in web client. Um, and, and that, and UDP as well. So it's, it's, and it can be adapted to pretty much everything. Um, our socket is basically kind of a serialization, deserialization protocol. As long as you can translate what you receive, you could even do our socket over Kafka or our socket over, I don't know, an elastic weaver. It's, it, it doesn't matter. It's just right. Uh, right. a it's just lower level construct. Okay. Got it. So that, that's one of the point. There are features obviously, um, coming out of the box as well. I think the main one, uh, to quote one in particular that is appealing to a lot of people and Facebook made a, a point about that when they presented at spring one is really what they call, we call, um, resumption or resuming a connection. So there is a concept of maintaining, keeping track of what data has been received and, and sent. And it's pretty useful when you you work on a mobile application, for instance, and you, you kind of lose connection time to time. Um, for Facebook, it was a use case uh, for, for them because they, they maintain a cache of everything you see on your iPhone or, or Android phone. Um, and sometimes you will lose the connection. And when you resume this connection, they don't want to repopulate all of this cache, which is costing a lot of money uh, multiplied by the number of users. Uh, they have. So with this resumption uh, thing uh, you can learn about on rsocket.io, they actually know f f what you already have received and what is still need needed to be sent. So they, re they repopulate the delta basically. And that's uh, the main thing they, they use it for. And One folks, feature. there you have another reason to delete Facebook off your phone if you didn't have enough before. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Uh, okay, um, let, uh, let's see, we're at 8.30, which is fine. Um, we still have a heck of a lot of people on the line, which is, which is also fine, so thanks for staying so long, everyone. Um, in the spirit of letting Josh go to the bathroom or eat or you know, do something else, um, do you have any last questions before we wrap up? Jeff, uh, right, um, more of a comment on gRPC bidirectional over WebSockets, kind of similar, yep. Can, can see your point there. Um, yeah, especially with like a higher level programming model, I can see why a lot of people would, would naturally go towards gRPC, but uh, yeah. Um, that'd be really interesting to see if Spring could kind of do its thing, right? And, and provide a agnostic, you know, POJO model sort of thing. But it sounds like you'd have a lot of scaffolding to build underneath um, to match the high level programming models. Maybe be, before there, there is another question, I just wanted to add, uh... Um, oh, actually, we have a question. Yeah, I think this is the money question, actually. Thanks for asking it, Emma. Um, that, that probably, probably the best question uh, on, 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 out of this whole thing is like, when do you do this? Um, oh, my God. That was exactly what I was going to talk about, actually. <laughs> you, Great question. You nailed it, Emma. <laughs> Way to go. Uh, you should um, deliver a talk, the next talk. So, submit me an abstract. Yeah, so that's um, that's the actual goal question. Um, so I think, and I, we discussed that this morning again with PayPal as uh, regular reactive uh, users. Uh, what drives us and what drives uh, PayPal, for instance, to use the reactive stuff is really um, first the cost uh, saving. So. We haven't documented that yet on our side because we're still evaluating and, and doing a bunch of uh, walk around adopting the reactive stuff at Netflix. But the, on the PayPal side, they pretty much advanced. They have like a year or two advance on, on this uh, road to transition to reactive. And they documented they saved uh, an XXX amount of money. <laughs> uh, I can't really uh, probably document here, but they, they have a significant cost saving. Um, and and that's probably the one thing that keeps uh, coming back to 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 people uh, with with the reactive stack in general. You're not making things faster, but you're running things with less. Um, so you give less money to Jeff Bezos, for instance. So th that's that's one driver. One other driver is uh, making things a bit more resilient. Uh, we have a, a case, for instance, at Netflix, where. We have a service and a downstream service wa was fading and a, 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 the calling service was waiting on the response of this service. Um, thanks to the spike of um, uh, Netflix uh, 
viewer this last month. And the problem is we were waiting for an answer from this remote service and we were holding it onto resources um, because we were using a blocking client on this service. So we changed that and we have redesigned and, and we, we have rethought that to use a non-blocking client, something like web client from Webflux to make sure that we don't have this, this kind of situation uh, anymore. But that's really a, a resiliency play as well. So making things more resilient and making things run for less are probably the main two drivers. Um, yeah. Yeah, I couldn't, couldn't have said it better. The last thing I would say, some, sometimes ah. people would like functional programming at some point. And I swear, yep. it doesn't look like that when you're learning or starting. But because the, the, the learning curve is like, Phew. but at the end, yeah. you know, it's kind of plateauing. And when you are at the plateau at the top, and you know, it's you get to other people uh, out there and you say, hey, I, I, I'm telling you, it's, it's getting better at the end. Um, it, it really is. But at, uh, what I want to say is um, I read functional code in a better way uh, nowadays than I kind of read uh, non-functional code because things, you, you know, you have a line and one intent. You, you've seen in, in Josh code, it's a step-by-step, -step, you have an intent. Um, if you think about what you're doing with um, normal you know, programming, uh, you, you do for loop inside, you do uh, if inside, you do, you call things to transform your data. Um, it, it's all the time a kind of nested, uh, you know, a, a Russian doll of things. And if you m mix that with the need of making code concurrent, that, that's pretty much um, very difficult to maintain. So I find a, even if people starting say the opposite, I find that at some point it's easier to maintain this kind of code. It's more scalable um, than you know regular programming. Not to say we don't need both. Um, I'm I'm never going. It's still today. Uh, I'm I'm not going to advocate that everyone should do reactive stuff. Um, you don't need to do that. But when you kind of see there is a win to have, uh, there are developers willing to try. And there are actual outcomes like cost saving and maintenance and um, resiliency. You, you're just going to be happy with the result. Um, I'm not. Yeah, I don't know what to say else. And it's simpler. Like I like I said, amortized over all the possible applications of the APIs. It's actually less code. It's less APIs to learn. SSE emitter or publisher. Web simple uh, message. Less, API, less APIs publisher. to learn doesn't necessarily translate to simpler. Um, if it's if it's a, it does. impossible yeah. to debug, I think we it's, lost. It's, yeah, yeah. No, I was just saying um, f from an outsider perspective. Now I think we lost you, Josh, because the uh, you 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 read the code uh, pretty pretty easily now. You can you know you can chain a number of reactive uh, features without problems. Right. But uh, well, there are still people out so. there which not you know they are not going to to be to that point yet. Uh, sure, but, like I said, the upfront cost is higher. But once you get past that, then once you've learned it, now you can explore all these other APIs, and it's way easier than having to learn different APIs, right? You've just got one kind of stuff. Uh, that's the point. I think it took uh, yeah. just a, a couple of months before you, you transform into a, a full uh, reactive guru. And but once you. Decent. you you, yeah, once you got there, I mean, now you write uh, at this speed all this kind of stuff and you combine, um, you know, we have the chance uh, at, in the Spring team to have a lot of projects, a lot of needs right. in enterprise covered. And so we have a reactive alternative for pretty much everything in, in the Spring team. Um, so so sure. the ecosystem is, is, is just there now. Um, it, and, you know, reactive is not new. It, was, uh, uh, it has been there for the last decade. Uh, but Spring came with the second mover advantage. Uh, it came late to the party, um, but it, it, it just aggregated a lot of uh, good uh, best practices in the space, a standard with reactive streams, and used the whole knowledge they had on a full vertical segment of everything enterprises need, the security, data, et cetera, et cetera, and, and apply the Spring source to make the pragmatic choices that will make these APIs um, you know, easier to, to give to, to people. 
And I don't want to sound, you know, Josh and, and Stefan, I mean, you, this is amazing tech. And I think you're right. It like, I think once this hit spring, like once reactive kind of started going to spring, it's like, whoa, this is mainstream. This is real deal. You know, this is, 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 uh, uh, been made a heck of a lot more accessible, uh, to, to mere mortals. But even then there's still a learning curve. And I think, you know, for the, for, sure. uh, I'm sorry, Emma, I think, you know, who's like going to her CIO tomorrow, it's like, okay, what is your team? You know, it's the pragmatic always questions that you have to look at, right? Like what, what is the composition of the team that I'm working with? Are there some reactive gurus? Are there, you know, to Stefan's point, people that are willing to become reactive gurus because there, there is that upfront learning curve, you know, debugging. I don't know, maybe it's gotten better since I looked at it last Stefan, but that was certainly a challenge. Uh, and clearly benefits. I get it, you know, absolutely. So uh, it's something to be considered. And, um, I think as the industry starts getting a more and more institutional knowledge around reactive programming, you're going to have just a wider fleet of available developers that get this stuff. Right. Um, and, and, you know, it won't be, uh, it'll be less of an issue of like, Oh, the learning curve. Well, it's been learned. You know, there's people out there that we can hire uh, that can do it, you know, or, you know, to your point, Stefan, you know, grow them organically, which is obviously a great thing for developers careers and, and, and awesome, you know, uh, learning because we're all technologists. Or as, as somebody mentioned earlier, you could just, you want the uh, deterministic imperative style of programming and you want the benefits of reactive use coroutines in Kotlin, but then you have to learn Kotlin. So it's no free, no free lunch, I guess. Yep. Yes, never, never a free, free lunch. lunch. Yep. <laughs> Speaking um, of lunch, uh, you probably haven't had dinner and it's 8.30. Um, I also need to go have dinner. So um, as much as I want to let this continue to go, this has been awesome, actually. I feel like we just had a master class in Reactive from um, some really amazing people. Uh, thank you, both of you, fun. Stefan. Thanks for having us. I don't know whether you conspired uh, to join here together, whether that was accidental, but boy, are we the beneficiaries. Um, thank you very much. Gratitude. for. It both. was a wonderful quinky dink. That's amazing. Okay. Yay. All right, everyone. Uh, look forward to uh, suggestions, submissions, uh, comments, criticisms, witticisms uh, about the, um, about the jug. And we are, I will send you a recording as soon as I can. Uh, not making any, I'm making a promise for the future to call back with, see what I did there. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm not as funny as Josh. I know. Um, but yes, I will send you uh, the YouTube video um, via email at some point in the future. Have a great That's evening. Cool. Uh, again, Josh, thank you. Any, anyone have anything else they want to say before we go? Looks like a thank you round. All right. Be safe, be well, um, and, and healthy. Take care, everyone. Take care. Good night. Bye.